Thank you very much, Johnny, and, and to all of you for coming to listen to us. I'll change uh, tact a bit and talk more in the personal finance space. And particularly why I've chosen this topic is after four years of very, very pedestrian returns, many of our advisors and clients are asking us, is this going to continue forever? Are we going to get some returns? And in particularly, clients already in retirement is very, very concerned. And they're saying, I'm sitting with a living annuity. Can this thing provide me with a sustainable income? So I'll see how much of your questions I can attempt to answer here. The one other thing is when I looked at living annuities to see what they are, someone reminded me yesterday, the first living annuity was sold in 1990. So that living annuity would be 29 years old today. If you start doing your modeling on a living annuity, interestingly, they don't ever crash within the first 10 years or 15 years. But as you go beyond 20 years, 25 years, if you have done the wrong things, weird things can happen there. And, and that's what I think. We are going into a time period over the next 10 years where many, many of these products are going to get to their 25th year anniversary and so forth. And we'll see what happens there. So what is a living annuity? Simply, it's a very, very flexible post-retirement product. The client takes all the investment risk, and typically there are no guarantees inside. So why do we like them? They give us a lot of flexibility in terms of the investments we can hold inside and the income we can draw. If you pass away early, you get a death benefit. What I don't think we always consider clearly is that with this flexibility comes a responsibility to manage the risks. And I'll dive into a bit of that today. So how does a life look, a lifetime for a client who is currently in retirement today drawing an income? And I try to give you a very, very simple picture. So bear with me for a, for a couple of seconds. Someone who's 70 odd year old today, they probably, if lucky, went to school for 18 years, entered the work environment, they worked from 18 till 65, many of them for only one company, maybe two. So they invested this investment phase for 47 years, retired at age 65, and on average, according to actuarial tables, they probably would have lived until age 84. So if I try and put this into a number to try and quantify this, most of you are numbers people, if I just say, how many years do you invest for every one year that you're going to withdraw? So divide 47 by 19, you get a ratio of roughly two and a half years that you put money in for every one year that you're going to take money out. How did this picture change just within our lifetime? Something like this. So currents, uh, clients currently in employment who are investing... They probably, after school, had to go study a bit. And for those of you who are parents, you probably think I'm very conser or conservative, you're aggressive, <laughs> thinking your client is going to leave your house and start employment at age 22. So let's assume that happens. This person is going to work for 38 years. The average retirement age in South Africa today is age 60. So at 60, they need to retire and... The average age of dying has shifted out a little bit as medical technology advances. So let's assume this client is going to live to 86, 86 according to actuarial tables. So if I again draw this picture, I have eight, 38 years of investing for every 26 years that I will need to draw on average. How does my simple formula look now? It has reduced from roughly two and a half to one and a half. So it's a 40% reduction in the number of years that you as an investor have to put money in and make that money work for every one year that you're going to take it out. Oh yeah, and there's this one little other thing that happened also in this lifetime of ours. We changed from a world where the previous picture was probably a defined benefit picture. Do you guys remember that? 
you contributed to a defined benefit fund at retirement, your employer said, Mr. Employee, your average salary over the last three years, 75% replacement ratio of that, I'm going to pay that to you for the rest of your life. We swap that world to a defined contribution world, which is very nice. You get your own little pot of money. You don't have to subsidize everyone else. And at retirement, your employers say, Mr. Employee, here you go. There's your pot. Cheers. Don't want to ever see you again. What happened? What happened is that from age 18 in that previous picture to 84, the employer took full investment risk and full longevity risk for 70 odd years on your life. And that has neatly shifted to you. So now you as the saver, the employee, takes on from age 22 to age 86 or beyond, full investment risk and full longevity risk, i.e. the risk that you may live longer. It's a very, very big shift in the responsibility. And my question is, does clients really know and expect that? And if they do, how has that changed the way they think about this 70-odd year endeavor of investing money for themselves? So if I go through a couple of very simple parameters, and please forgive me, I'm venturing into your world mostly here today of retirement planning, if you start with a simple base case, someone starting at age 25, you save 12.5% of your salary. Why 12.5%? It should be more. That's the average according to the, I think, the Sundown Benchmark survey. You retire at age 60. Let's assume you want to draw an income to give you a 75% replacement ratio. What does that mean? That your salary after retirement drops by 25% in retirement. And let's assume you earn an investment return throughout your entire lifetime, pre and post retirement of 4% above inflation, net of all fees. That's quite aggressive. This is our base plan. So let's fiddle a bit with, I'll get to this now. Let's fiddle a bit with these numbers. Let's assume you could start saving earlier, so you change 25 to 20, you can score an additional number of years in retirement. On the base case, there were 17 years that your money will last. In other words, your money is going to last from 60 to 77. It's probably not enough. Okay, If you could start earlier, if I look through the room, I don't see many 20-year-olds, so that option is probably off the table. Let's then at least say, should we contribute more? Let's put 18% in here. Clearly, you get a very nice pickup if you change that one parameter. So I'm changing one at a time here, just to give you a feel. You obviously pull many of these levers at the same time, if you can. Let's assume you can work a little bit longer. That option probably still available to many, potentially. You get an additional eight years, but this one is a double whammy. Because the additional eight years don't go from 60, it goes from 65. So you actually score 13 years. Your money lasts until 90. If you could work an additional five years. If you could drop your replacement ratio, and for those of you who sit in front of clients and try and convince them to take less money in retirement, you would know much better than me that's a near impossible conversation. You can score a number of years. Probably not really a viable option. If you then turn to the investment return assumption, and why do I focus on this? Because I think that's the one lever you can probably pull, no matter how old you are, what you do here. If you change this to 6%, effectively the situation changed to infinity. Your money will last. Note that this is inflation plus 6 net. SA equities over 100 years has given you inflation plus 7. So take off how many fees you think is reasonable. You will need some serious juice to, in order to deliver that. It suffice to say, seeing that that, uh, that one is potentially one of the easier levers to pull, let's investigate that lever a bit. 
and why people don't pull it. So let's just say you start saving at 30, you save for 30 years till 60 and you retire. And the first scenario I put on the table here is what I call the money under the mattress scenario. Right? Very simple. You take your money, you put it under the mattress, and you earn 0%. If you have grandparents or so, they, that was a viable option. Your money doesn't last for long. It's about four years that they last. Okay? And obviously, in retirement, you start taking money from underneath the mattress to fund your life. So it's obviously an extreme scenario. Let's contrast that with a scenario of where you would earn 5% real throughout your entire life, pre- and post-retirement. Clearly, this is a much nicer picture, a theoretical picture, and your money lasts now until 90. Why am I showing you this picture? Two reasons. The one is, the difference between these two graphs is only one thing, investment return. It's the only parameter we changed. What does that mean? This is your investment returns earned throughout your entire lifetime. Now, if I were to add up all your returns earned pre-retirement and everything post-retirement, and I express that as a percentage of your entire lifetime, I get an interesting picture like this. 87% of your total investment returns earned in your lifetime is earned when? After retirement. Why is that such a big insight, at least to me? Because when you sit here with a client, and many of you have done this, the client comes to you and says, Mr. Advisor, this is my only part of money. It needs to last me for my entire lifetime. Can we please invest this money conservatively? Have you ever heard that? <laughs> right? Meaning you don't want volatility. So clearly then... Post-retirement, if you invest conservatively, you can't assume inflation plus 5. So let's assume something else. Inflation plus 2. Pick a number. That's what happens. So Mr. Client, by all means, you can invest conservatively. But please understand the impact of your choice of investing conservatively. You lose more than 10 years of retirement income someday. Please understand, this is the real cost of de-risking at retirement. Now, why do people do that? This is the 40-year real return on SA equities, bonds, and cash. I've given you the 40-year slide. The 100-year slide looks exactly the same, except then you don't see all these nice wobblies so nice. So effectively, if you invested one rand 40 years ago in cash, you would have two rand 24 today. If you put everything in bonds, you would have three rand, so you tripled your money. If you put it in equities, you made 16 times your money. Okay. So, yes, we would obviously all like to have some exposure to that top red line in hindsight. Why don't we put too much money in that top red line? Because this is a very volatile line. So if I ask you which is the more risky line on the graph, you are probably going to tell me it's the red line. I would challenge you that when you think about providing for retirement, which is a 70-year affair now, I would argue these are the risky lines. Right? So my idea here is to challenge a bit of the conventional thinking. If you put a significant chunk of all of your money into these lines when saving for retirement, I would argue you are going to have a very fantastically smooth joyride to zero very quickly. So in retirement from 60, you can put all your money in these lines, provided, obviously, if you have enough. If you have whatever, pick a number, 100 million in the bank, put all your money here, you're going to sleep like a baby. But when I look at most clients in South Africa, they don't have that particular problem. So I would argue most clients would need a healthy chunk of that. But you need to understand the risks 
of that. In my mind, that risk is not just volatility when you think about. Think more about sequence risk and behavior risk, which I'll quickly del uh, go into. But here, yeah, you have a significant risk of living too long. So in my mind, investment risk when saving for retirement is less about volatility and more about are you going to run out of money before you die? That is a particularly bad situation to be in. So focusing on this volatility a bit, and when I talk about volatility, people talk about standard deviations. I don't understand that. I try to simplify things. This is the world that we live in for the last three to four years. And in my mind, volatility means your risky assets underperform your supposedly safe, i.e. low volatile assets. So cash and bonds are outperforming equities and property over the last couple of years. And your client are sitting in front of you and say, Mr. Advisor, why the hell should I take on all that volatility if I could sit here in the safe asset and earn a lot of money? Have you heard that before? Clients coming to you and say, let's move to cash. By the way, top performing asset class is a bonds. That's the three years since Nannygate. How many clients put their money into SA bonds when all the newspapers said, get out of SA bonds, you're absolutely crazy. By the way, get out of South Africa. I think the only people who put money in SA bonds was David and Johnny and team in our client portfolios. So what do clients do to this? Because there's a way to see what they actually do. Go look at the numbers. I've picked three categories. A CISA categories, unit trust funds, multi-asset I, your average balance fund, average conservative balance fund, multi-asset low equity, and an income fund. These are the 20-year average lines of how much money go into each of those categories over every 12-month period. So balance funds take 25 billion rand per year on average over the last 20 years. What happened in the last couple of years? Balance funds were there and there about. Oh, there's obviously a bit of a fall off. The biggest category within living annuities went from plus 20 billion per 12 months to minus 7.5 billion. This has been the worst category in terms of net flows for 12 quarters, the last 12 quarters. Where did the money go? Cash. From minus 10 billion typically paying income out of these things to plus 40 billion. That's a 50 billion swing per annum. So what's happening here? Clients are either switching to cash or all new money goes into cash. Because you're obviously going to switch back into the market before it. <laughs> yeah. And when I talk to clients and advisors... At and they put money here. So why do you put money here? To say, now we're going to wait for the market to recover. And then we... Oh, that makes sense, huh? You need some shoes and your shoes are on a 50% sale. And you say, no, 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 there's something wrong. Yeah, I don't trust this. I'm going to wait until the sale goes away and I'm going to pay full price again. But it's not your clients that do this. It's the clients in Cape Town with the laid back advisors. Um, another way of looking at this, and apologize, some of you may have seen this slide two years ago, but I've updated it for the last couple of years of data. This is the most popular multi-asset low equity fund. This is a conservative balance fund. What I've put here is the rolling one-year performance relative to its peers. It's about 160 funds in that category. So if you play here like this fund, you're in the top 25% of funds and the top 10%, you're obviously very good. And I roll it, all those dots, I roll it forward, uh, rolling one year every quarter. And these bars are the ASISA net flows into that fund. So I do it every quarter because we get this data every quarter. In other words, what do we say? We look at a fund fact sheet. 
over a rolling one year, this has been a very good fund compared to all the competitors. We reward this manager. We give them roughly one and a half billion net flows into the fund per quarter. Then we roll it forward. Uh, this manager loses the plot. What do we do? We take money away. Clearly, they're not a good manager anymore. Guess what happens next? Obviously, it was just a short-term thing. This is a top quartile manager. They know how to manage money. Two and a half billion per quarter we give them, and then they l lost the plot completely. Literally, the last fund in the category. These guys are bad. They can't manage money. What do we do? We take money away. Again, you're not going to have a uh, guess what happens next. This game plays out perfectly. And I stopped it there. What happened over the last two years? This category didn't take any money. Remember, the worst category of the last 12 quarters. This fund happened to be still first quarter. And we, that's the one fund that takes money. This is what we do as behavior. We chase the winner. Would you want to venture a guess what this manager says on their fund fact sheet, what they target over a rolling one year? Any guesses? No, they say nothing about a rolling one year. They target returns rolling three to five years plus. So in my mind, there's a clear disconnect here between what the manager tries to do and what the clients are trying to do. And if there's a mismanage, you're going to part ways in some way. Is it possible to quantify this effect on investment returns? It's not perfect. In theory, I would need to have every single client ever in that fund's data, which I'll obviously never have. But you can calculate the fund return since inception. That's about 12% return over the last 18 years. For a conservative balance fund, that's inflation plus 6 odd, which is awesome. That's a time-weighted return. If I take all this money moving out and I use that on aggregate to calculate the average client's return, that's the green bar. You get 2.2% less return per annum. What is the impact thereof? If you do your financial planning at age 60, you want to take your 1 million to 90, you use that fund's return. Your perfect planning does this. And then the client comes in and does that. You lose 10 years worth of income because of behavior chasing the winner. Do you know how many conversations I've had about five basis points and 10 basis points worth of fees? In fact, I had one this morning right outside that door. There is 220 basis points for you for free. It is there. And it's, I'm only showing you this one fund today. I've done it on all the top 10 and top 20 funds in the industry, all balanced. They all look the same. In fact, that number is typically bigger. Typically averages at 350 basis points per annum. So let's turn a bit to uh, actual money that's happening. And what I've done here is I've taken a client who retires, a very fortunate client, with 10 million rand. So you start with 10 million rand, and I went back to get the actual fund data and SA as long as I could go back. And I could go back to 2002. That's how long the data is available. And let's assume, I'm going to assume this client puts all his money into one category. And I'm going to show you four categories. I know you don't do that, but I'll, I'll try and give you the spectrum of outcomes. So this client puts all his money in an income fund. The average income fund, so that is, according to Morningstar, the average income fund's return after that fund's fees. I didn't put in here platform and advisor's fees. So I only went with the actual data. So this client starts with a 5% income. 5% 5 of 10 million is 500,000. And every year he resets his income to 5% of his capital at the start of that year. That's how his capital grow, uh, his income grow over time. In total, since 2002, this client took out 10.4 million rand. 
This is his capital after he paid all this income, and he ends on just below 16 million rand. If this client happened to put all his money in the multi-asset income just one notch above, that's how the picture would look like. A million odd rand more in income over this period, and he now ends on 18 million rand capital. Note both of these lines, how nicely they go like this. This is after a purple patch of four years of cash being king. And they've grown very, very well. That's your multi-asset low equity. Conservative balance funds. And you can see that of, even after four years of going nowhere, you're still above cash and your total income that you took out is also about 600,000 more. And I thought, what the hell, let's put in a balance fund as well for those of you who've got, want some real VUMA. Clearly, a lot more money, but clearly a very bumpy ride in capital. Obviously, that capital has also gone nowhere in five years. The problem with this is the sequence of return risk. Who can, what client can afford that drop in income and the big clients can't do that. So how do you manage sequence risk? There's a couple of things if you read all the academic papers. The first one is you start with 5% of income, and then you increase annually just with the last year's inflation. Why does that make sense? Because that's exactly what happens to us before retirement. Your salary gets increased every year roughly with inflation, ignoring promotions. So that makes sense. So for all four of these categories, the answer obviously looked the same. So let's look at what happens to the capital. There's your income, average income fund, slightly less capital than in the previous example. Multi-asset income. There's your multi-asset low equity fund. And again, even after four years of going nowhere, you're still above cash in the long term. There's your balance fund. So over the long term, it pays to take some additional risk. But I saw an interesting stat the other day. I attended investment forum, like many of you probably did, and one of the large SA investment platforms showed a study. I don't know if any one of you have seen it. That platform is in business for nearly 25 years. It went and did an analysis on every single client they have. And they calculated the internal rate of return for each of their clients, which will be what did that client earn after all costs? And uh, it was slightly scary. 71% of their clients failed to beat inflation. Think about it. 71% of clients fail to beat inflation. So if I were to work that example into my picture, take the same income as the previous ones, that's what your capital would look like if you only achieved inflation. So that is when you put fees, poor behavior, running away from volatility, everything together. What's my concern with this? My concern with this is as we go into this 25 and 29 year, year anniversaries of living annuities, for the guys who behaved like this, their living annuities are going to crash. What's going to happen? The journalists in the room are going to write how bad living annuities are. Right? What's going to happen then? The regulator is going to step in and say, all of you, industry, asset managers, platforms, advisors, Clearly, you can't handle this flexibility. Let me regulate you into some rules. I would think that's not what we want. My point is, it's not the living annuity. It's not the vehicle. It's a flexible vehicle. If you go outside here and go buy the best car you can get in sand and brand new Mercedes-Benz, the best technology you can find, the best vehicle, if you think it's a Bentley or whatever, and if you go and drive that car at high speed straight into oncoming traffic, you are going to crash. Is it a poor vehicle or is it the driver? And I think that's what we need to ask each other. 
if you look at the academic research, the next point how you can manage uh, sequence risk is valuation sensitive asset allocation. In other words, active asset allocation, where you buy assets when they are cheaper and you sell them where they are more expensive. The only example I can show you is two of our funds. So this is the average multi-asset low equity fund, an inflation plus fund. Even after four years of both of these going nowhere, you still have significant fat in the system. That's the picture on balance fund. Both of these are A-classes. You all probably invest in the clean classes. For those of you who use it, again, significant fat in, in the system. So active asset allocation do work over the long term. This is not a one-year and a three-year game. I'm talking about retirement investment. This is a long-term game. So to conclude on my side, living annuities are very flexible. They give you a lot of flexibility, but with that flexibility comes responsibility. And we need to take that very seriously. You need to consider how much growth assets you put in pre- and post-retirement. You can't just go full conservative at retirement. Then you're going to have a very smooth ride to zero very quickly. You need to manage the risks, and more importantly, you need to manage the client's financial behavior. This is where you guys, I think, can play an absolute critical role to help the client stick to their financial plan. And from our side, we do think consistency is the only currency that matters in the long term. We would love to partner with you and stay partnering with you on your client's retirement journey. Thank you very much for your time.